Hello, Dr. Simon Freilich, back with the Clinical Neurophysiology Channel, and we are going to continue talking about how we measure sleep. In this video, we're going to talk about actigraphy and uh, smart watches, activity trackers, uh, those kind of wearable technologies. Now, there are two questions really which need to be addressed through all of this, which is number one, are wearables worthwhile? And number two, for whom are they worthwhile? In order to answer these, we have to think about three things. What are we measuring? How are we measuring it? And why are we measuring it? So in the previous video, link above, um, I've talked about polysomnography and this chart over here, you can see the research uh, publications on PubMed, um, relating to polysomnography uh, studies, actigraphy, and sleep tracking wearables. And it's very much datable um, in relation to improvements in sensors, improvements in batteries, and improvements in computing, uh, and you know, portable computing as well. So polysomnography is considered the gold standard uh, for a number of reasons, but the fundamental drawbacks is, you know, the equipment's expensive, um, Getting a lab together is you know, expensive. Um, the labor involved is intensive as well. Um, you need someone to sit there and score through everything, or even if you've got a, an algorithm to go through things, you still have to go and check through. Um, and it's highly skilled, which means there aren't that many people who've got the knowledge to uh, process that data. So for those reasons, yes, it's the gold standard, but it comes with drawbacks. And so uh, there are other ways to try and measure sleep or the impact of sleep problems or identification of them. So the most low tech method really um, of recording sleep is really pen and paper, uh, you know, with an interview, sleep diaries, various uh, sleep health questionnaires and so on. They have drawbacks, um, but we're going to be focusing in this one about the sort of intermediate technology, actigraphy, smart wearables and, and smartphones. Now, before I say anything else, actually, on the subject of smartphones, uh, the apps on the smartphones have not been proven to be particularly accurate. So actually, let's not talk about those. Let's just uh, stay with the actigraphy and the smart wearables. Um, so. So those are the ways we can we can record sleep using surrogate markers because we're not going to be actually recording from the brain itself, which is enormously complicated. There are other ways to record uh, sleep problems or problems during sleep. Um, so if someone's got sleep disordered breathing, one of the most basic ways we can look at that is looking at the oxygen saturations um, and whether they dip during the night. Uh, we can look at carbon dioxide levels, that's capnography. Um, if there are questions about arrhythmias, uh, irregular heartbeats and, and events relating to that, well, we can have a look at the ECG, electrocardiogram, and the states, the EKG. Of course, we can also look at blood pressure as well. So what is actigraphy? Um, so this is actually measurement of movement. And the, the fundamental premise of this is that during sleep, we move less by definition. And so we can actually measure movement as a surrogate of sleep. And so what we do is we basically put an accelerometer, which measures uh, movements on the uh, wrist of the non-dominant uh, arm, so the one that you would sort of move less. Um, and what we can do is we can measure the voltage um, against the time. So if we take a, a minute, for example, and we can uh, plot through the, the voltage of movement, um, in this particular example, you can see basically three peaks. And then we can analyze that in a variety of different ways. We can do something called the zero cross method. So if we put a line pretty close to zero volts, um, then we can see the number of times that the voltage crosses that zero line. In this case, where there's three peaks, it would be six times. So it'd be six times in a minute. We can also measure uh, the time above threshold, and that can tell us the duration of movement and we can also measure how vigorous that movement is by measuring the area um, of that which would be the proportional integrating measure. Now when we send someone home with one of these actigraphy type watches uh, what we do is we need to identify the periods of interest because people will be wearing these for a long period of time so we need to work out when people fall asleep. Now this could happen using a button on the watch when people put themselves to bed um, alternatively or in combination with one can have a sleep diary as well which can give us that information and we can sort of focus in on those particular 
uh, periods of time. And then what we do is we take all of that data, uh, and that can be for you know a week or even two weeks or so, and we can process that data using special algorithms. Now, the formulas used will vary by the type of actigraphy uh, watch that's being worn, um, but um, it also will depend on what's being measured as well, and they're all a variation of moving averages. A really excellent paper if you're interested um, in the details um, over here. Now, there is a very important Achilles heel, because remember, we always have to understand what we are measuring. So what we're measuring here is activity. And if you're just lying still in bed, actigraphy will appear uh, to suggest that someone may be asleep. So it's very difficult to differentiate someone who's lying still but awake with someone who is asleep. In addition to which, there are also different definitions of when sleep is scored as well. So sleep diaries play a very important role, um, but you know most will also have additional sensors to the actual movement ones, whether it's marker buttons, whether the patient can push a button, whether it's light sensors which can see whether the lights are off in the room, uh, body position as well, um, or temperature sensors too, because temperature dips down as we fall asleep, um, and others as well, depending on your make and model. But the net result is that if we're thinking about uh, sort of measured uh, sleep parameters, the sleep onset latency, that's the time it takes uh, to fall asleep, tends to be underestimated um, because the watches will think that you fall asleep earlier than you might have and also wakefulness after sleep onset uh, it also tends to be underestimated because um, the watch will think that you are still asleep even if you're lying in bed let's say you've woken up in the middle of the night you're just trying lying still trying to fall fall asleep again um, and it will still think that you are you've gone back to sleep earlier than you have and so the net effect is that your total sleep time tends to be overestimated now is that important? Well, it can be, particularly, um, you know, if you're looking at an issue where maybe sleep disordered breathing is being investigated, maybe with a pulse oximeter. So what can frequently happen is because of the difficulties arranging polysomnography, um, people can perhaps have a, a poly, um, can have a uh, pulse oximeter study over the course of the night. And if one's looking for the number of desaturations um, through the night, it's actually very important to have some measure of the total sleep time so you can make that division. And you can try and work out how many times um, through the night or per hour someone is having desaturations. And that can be a very important parameter. So, um, you know, it, it can actually be very important to try and get this right. Um, Having said all of that, there are various corrective factors which are applied to these scoring algorithms after it's processed and details in that paper um, above. Um, but you know, fundamentally, when you look at them, um, they all tend to be a sort of a, a corrective um, feature of a, of a type of a regression line um, and don't necessarily make biological sense. So um, there are issues fundamentally by uh, looking at uh, movement alone. Now the strengths of this are you can get some really decent long recordings, as I've said, for a week, maybe two weeks. Patterns of sleep are very easily identified. That's particularly useful for people who've got uh, circadian rhythm disorders, so people who are sort of night owls, um, who go to bed extra late at night and have difficulty waking up in the morning, or vice versa, people who wake up too early. Um, so those general type of patterns are very, very helpful. Um, we can also have a look at patterns of behaviour, for example, which can help differentiate perhaps uh, REM behaviour disorder from maybe restless leg syndrome. Um, not as good as polysonography. In addition to which, uh, you've got guaranteed high sampling frequencies, you've got very bespoke software, um, and you can use it in tandem with other monitoring modalities too, and it can be a screening tool prior to commencing to polysonography. Now, when we think about sleep tracking activity, wearables, smartwatches, there, there's been a huge interest, an explosion of growth of interest in, in our health, um, wearable tech, and uh, to use that turn of phrase, living our best life. Um, and this all occurred in tandem with advances in sensors, uh, batteries, smartphones, artificial intelligence. Um, and I would say that the really the major advance on actigraphy uh, was actually integrated 
rating heart rate data. Um, and it does it in a way that I think actigraphy uh, would struggle to do. So the way it's done these days is with a photo plethysmography uh, method. And so what's happening is, is if you have a look on the back of your smartwatch, it will be flashing pulses, usually of green light, um, and it's measuring uh, capillary flow, blood flow through the capillaries um, as a function of time. And doing that, you can calculate the heart rate. So it's an indirect measure of the heart rate. Now, everything has its Achilles heel. So if you are into sort of the nitty gritty of uh, wearables, um, you'll know that when it comes to vigorous exercise, it's not as good as um, an ECG, EKG, um, for measuring an accurate heart rate at high rates of, of a heart rate. But actually, it's perfect during low levels of activity and especially during rest. So that's a very useful method for measuring your heart rate. It also has the advantage of being able to detect variations in respiration, particularly for those who are healthy and for those who are younger, because we know as we inhale, our heart rate increases. As we exhale, our heart rate decreases. And so there are various effects of heart rate on that flow. And in addition to which, um, during sleep, there are changes in the peripheral circulation which tally with different sleep states. So we know that um, heart rate and respiratory rates change with sleep, uh, sleep states. The artificial intelligence engines behind this have um, far more information to suck out, to correlate than when comparing to standard actigraphy. And it can allow, I think, for more accurate determination of when sleep occurs, but also, and this is quite important, the potential for indirectly differentiating sleep uh, stages far better than actigraphy ever could. And you also have the benefit of um, smoothing out of errors with having all of these different uh, aspects put together. And also you have the benefits of big data when it's published. So let's think about big data. Now this is from Fitbit, uh, which is just one of a number of uh, smartwatch or activity tracker um, manufacturers and, and providers. And so this is actually during the uh, corona pandemic at the very outset of it. And they had a look, um, you can see this over here, um, at what happened overall to uh, the change in, in sleep um, for younger people versus older people. Younger people at the start of the pandemic through the lockdowns were getting more sleep, uh, nearly uh, about 25 minutes over there, nearly half an hour. Uh, older people were actually on average uh, sleeping seven fewer minutes um, of sleep. And also interestingly, you could see as well um, when the lockdowns were introduced. Um, so obviously Italy came in first and you can see that the average uh, sleep minutes increase uh, was far earlier than for the rest of Europe uh, when you look through that. As with everything, there is a but. These are calibrated for active, healthy populations where heart rate circulation is regular and it's reactive and there aren't impediments to uh, capillary flows, etc. We're also not um, measuring brainwaves directly. It's uh, you know, an indirect measure of things that correlate to sleep stage. The frequency of overnight sampling and overnight recording of those samples is uncertain. You can have a look on the forums for yourself. Um, and actigraphy data is fundamentally better designed to provide information for an individual. It can be very, very detailed and it, obviously it can be integrated with other systems too. The next question is why? Why would you want to measure your sleep? Why would you go and invest in wearable tech to uh, try and understand your sleeping patterns? So some people are just genuinely interested. Some people do it because, well, it's a feature I can, why not? Um, some people actually do get quite obsessive about it and it's called orthosomnia uh, now. Um, but it's important to explain that modifying your sleep patterns does not depend on your watch and modifying your sleep staging isn't consciously possible as far as I'm aware. Um, but improving your sleep hygiene certainly is. Um, there are certain 
things that we can do to improve the quality of our sleep. So if you are worried about a lack of sleep, there are certain things you can do to help yourself really. Um, so obviously, you know, things like avoiding caffeine, usually from about four o'clock um, in the afternoon uh, would be ideal. Uh, reducing stressful activities or stressful thoughts. So, you know, not logging into your work uh, emails uh, you know just before you fall asleep uh, or watching horror films or whatever you know things like that uh, reducing uh, particularly blue lights and screen time is very important blue light is quite activating uh, for our circadian rhythms puts them out of sync reducing uh, noises in our rooms uh, reducing uh, light pollution in general so if you've got sort of thicker curtains uh, it can be a good thing temperature optimization becoming comfortable it's very important not too hot uh, some people advocate lowering the temperature but you know it's about being comfortable really and it's generally improving our nighttime routines you know having a, a good schedule uh, is incredibly important and you can see more information from the american association of sleep medicine uh, with a link below so just to summarize, are wearables worthwhile measures? Yes, both for actigraphy and for the smart uh, watches. Are these technologies improving all the time? Absolutely. For whom are they worthwhile? Well, if you're just interested, mm, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't really say it's a particularly useful thing to route to, to be going down, uh, but it can be a very helpful way to sort of do an automated way to document uh, overall sleeping patterns. Um, and certainly it can be a very good way to commence a conversation with a, a general practitioner or family practitioner, uh, have you call your local family doctor um, or sleep professionals when there are problems with a, a diary um, generated by, by those kind of things. So hope you found this useful. If you have, please do um, hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe and hopefully looking forward to seeing you in the next video shortly. All the very best.